So again, we're very glad you're here. We hope you learn a lot. Stick around. We do have a plan to do a quiz. And I hear that there's a gift certificate for the lucky winner or the informed and educated winner. So yeah, without much more ado, let's welcome Josh Barnhill. He's going to be covering our community moment on senior as a senior analytics consultant for Slalom and talk to us about the Tableau e-learning program. And we can see your screen. Go Perfect. ahead, Josh. Nick, thank you. And, and welcome, everybody. And, and thanks, thanks for taking this time. And it is, it is a real pleasure to, to join you. Uh, so my name is Josh Barnhill. Uh, I'm a senior program manager uh, with Tableau Education. And I do happen to be based in uh, lovely Castle Rock, Colorado at this point, um, a little bit south of Denver. And with that, I'll just go ahead and jump in. I'll show a few slides. And I know some questions might come in on, on chat. And so we'll, we'll try to weave in some, some answers to those questions. And then if not, we'll, we'll, we'll get them at the end of the session. But then after just a couple of quick slides, I will also show uh, Tableau e-learning and some of the associated uh, kind of assessments to help you figure out how to use Tableau e-learning, as well as some things about Tableau e-learning for students and for uh, people in, a, in an organizational environment who need to administer Tableau e-learning. I'll just do a quick look at that so that you can get a sense for how it would work um, if that might happen to be some people's roles. So with that, we'll just go ahead and, and get started. So Tableau, we, we pivoted away. We pivoted away from product-oriented education and toward role-based training. And so that helps people and organizations onboard more quickly and boosts productivity and then helps users, maybe most importantly, helps users gain confidence in their analytics skills. So again, what, what is in the Tableau e-learning product? 13 learning paths, one each for 13 different job roles. As well, there are digital badges that align to the Tableau blueprint. And so each learning path offers a curated set of online courses, uh, as well as an assessment that measures your technical knowledge. And then if you pass the assessment, then you earn a digital badge um, that you can actually share on LinkedIn. And it actually is, is able to be shared on other sites, but mostly, mostly it gets shared on LinkedIn. So this is not a marketing spiel, but I did wanna get kind of out of the way up front that Tableau e-learning is generally a paid product. And so we sell one year access for $120 for everything, all 13 of those learning paths, or $60 a year for what we call uh, e-learning for Explorer. And that subscription includes the four learning paths shown in that middle column, the executive sponsor, community leader, uh, consumer, and there's, there's one more that, that we'll look at when we look at the site. But sampling is always free. And so you'll see, you see a link at the bottom there. And I think these slides will be going out. At least, at least we'll make sure that some of them do. Um, so at that sample site, you can always take the first course in each of the learning paths without purchasing. And as well, there's a, a data literacy course with about seven hours of content it's very uh, statistics heavy, right? So just a lot of great data concepts. And that course is, is always free on the sample site. As well, I promise we will look at this. Um, if you're not sure which learning path you fit into, then there is a super quick assessment tool uh, that helps you answer that question. These are the learning paths. Um, I mentioned 13, I think this shows 12. There really are two author paths, depending on whether you are uh, more of a desktop author or more of a web author. And so, yep, and then that, that adds up to 13. You can see that they're, they're grouped into three different categories, just depending on whether your job role is more about enabling a data culture uh, or about that, that middle column of sharing insights and developing visualizations, uh, or if it's about you know, deploying and managing Tableau environments. And there are three different, three different paths there. 
This might be my last slide before we, we start looking at Tableau e-learning, or there might be one more after this. I wanted to, to tip you off that if you're in an organization that buys Tableau e-learning for you know, a number of people, then that organization has the ability to look at user analytics. Man, maybe this is a surprise. Maybe some folks are, are using, using Tableau at a company and they didn't realize that somebody might, might have the ability to, to look at their, um, their uh, usage. And so, yeah, for an organization that buys and then provides e-learning to, um, to employees, then that's, that's an option. And besides a really high level snapshot view that you see here, that's just showing you know, all up course registrations and active students and then total session time, then there are also detailed reports uh, by course and per student and then per enrollment, which is the concept of um, enrollment is just one, one course as registered by one student. So every kind of student course pair is considered an enrollment and an organization can see the whole list of those and see a bunch of details about those. So with that, uh, right. So just before we, we, we maybe pause for questions and, and go to the demo, I did want to put up these, these um, statistics just to show you know, why, why e-learning matters. Um, it helps you work more independently. Uh, that's, that's what our, our users are telling us. And that, that goes to the way that it's been um, designed and the way that it's organized on the, on the portal, the way that the paths work, the way that people feel more confident um, as well. You know, people are digging in deeper to Tableau after they take e-learning. They're feeling more, some combination of inspired and, and capable and confident to, to try things that they hadn't tried before. With that, I'll just pause for a moment just to just to ask, uh, you know, I don't know if it's Nick or others, if, if there were any questions that came in that we wanted to cover now, otherwise I'm happy to jump over to the demo. It look, looks like we do have one question uh, from Brandon. It's, uh, how, how do you connect to the data source for the e-learning analytics? So I think, oh, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think I know what you're getting at there. Um, what we do, well, so you can work with your, account rep and it's just a pretty simple request that the account rep can make uh, they usually know how to how to make it if not they they find me and, and we, we get that we get that request made and then maybe one or two people in the organization just by email address uh, we'll get them signed up and then they get an invitation email directly from um, skilljar which is the hosting portal for tableau e -Learning. so uh, the answer is is talk with your account rep and they can make it happen well, great. Well, I am going to be looking down this way, so don't don't mind that. That's just me looking at, at my laptop screen. Um, so, I mentioned that there was a quick and easy tool to help you figure out which uh, which learning path might be right for you. Essentially, it's based on your job role, but some people's titles and roles span multiple things, and this this just helps you helps you kind of focus in. It's a very easy quiz, so it's it's just two questions. Um, here, I'm just hovering over the, the three choices for the first question. I'll, I'll go ahead and say, hey, I use Tableau for, for insight analysis or data visualization. Oh, and of course, oh, there we go, yeah, good. You know, I was gonna say, it's a demo, so of course it's not gonna work. And then, and then the, second, the second question pops up and it gives you a little more detail on that. Uh, you know, I'll say I leverage Tableau as my main visualization tool for sharing insights. And then it's going to say uh, for advanced analytics and machine learning projects. I guess I should have read the, the rest of that. And then it's saying, aha, okay, so your learning path is probably data scientist. Um, and you, this tool is, is pretty simple. You can just kind of click around and, and see what, what the different options yield. And then the, the go buttons here will just will take you directly to the e-learning sites. But I'm just going to switch tabs here. And I'm going to walk through briefly the those three sites that I mentioned, there's the sample site, and then there's uh, e-learning for explorer, and then e-learning for creator. And I'll probably spend more time on e-learning for creator, that's kind of the main, the main site. The sample site, you can see it in the URL there, uh, does of course give you the option to buy, but you can, you can go ahead and scroll down past that. And you can see that on the sample site, that data literacy for all course, that's about seven hours of content is, is fully, fully available to everyone. 
And then you'll see little icons for whether it's the explorer or the uh, creator um, learning path for, for each, of the, each of the 13 learning paths. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click, I think the analyst learning path, that's certainly one of the, the most commonly used and just give you a sense for how, how it looks. So since I'm in the sample site, I'll see a lot of them as locked, right? And that just means, ah, okay, I'm on the sample site. This hasn't, I haven't paid for this yet. But in order to, to, to sort of prove to you that indeed you, you do always get the first course for free, then here at the very top, there's no lock sign on it and it's not grayed out, is the getting started with Tableau desktop. And then the sample site is a great way to explore what's in each of the, each of the um, learning paths. So I'm just gonna scroll through this one and see, look, it starts with a getting started course. Then there's a Tableau fundamentals. I would just do one quick note about that. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the idea of a course called uh, Desktop One, uh, for maybe from instructional ed training or maybe from, from e-learning. We are changing away from that Desktop One terminology and we have renamed this course as the Tableau Fundamentals. And eventually we'll rename Desktop Two and Desktop Three. Um, so they won't have that, that kind of focus only on desktop. They, are, they now focus on both desktop and online. Um, and I'll, I'll just keep scrolling here. So then there's, there's a course on using Prep Builder. It's a getting started course, so it's, it's always free. And then every learning path ends with a skills assessment where uh, you answer, oh gosh, about, about 15 to 20 questions. And then if you pass that, test or that assessment with a better than 80%, then it, it sends you a um, digital badge. So that is what the sample site looks like. Let me go ahead and switch over to the Explorer uh, site quickly. The, the data literacy course, again, is on all three of them. And then I mentioned there were only four learning paths with, with uh, Explorer. And indeed there are, so here, here they are. Um, we also, yeah, that's right. We also added web author to, to the Explorer site. Um, and I think it's, it's maybe worth taking just a moment to, to note that e-learning isn't only for people who are using Tableau to build visualizations, right? Or, or not only for people who are you know, managing a, an infrastructure, a server infrastructure, or being a site administrator. It is also for people who are an executive sponsor or a community leader within their organization. Um, maybe they're not, maybe they're, maybe they're using visualizations, they're, they're consuming them, um, which is the primary focus of the consumer path. But really someone's job role can be, hey, I wanna be a sponsor for, for data culture. I wanna be a sponsor for analytics within my organization. And the learning path and then the badge are very helpful uh, for someone to be able to do that. So it's, yeah, it's it's not only for, for folks who are sort of, you know, using Tableau Desktop or Tableau Online to build things day in, day out. I think that's worth noting, and you see those two here in, in gray. With that, because we do have lots of stuff to look at, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump over to, really to our, to our flagship product, uh, which is Tableau eLearning for Creator. And I'll go ahead and launch, I'll go ahead and launch a course in here. There are some navigation features here. You can display, you know, sort of all content or just the learning paths or just uh, a few kind of independent standalone courses that may also be in the learning paths, but we like to kind of show those separately. Let's go ahead and click that briefly so you can, you can get a sense of what those additional courses are that might not quite fit into a learning path. Um, so some do, like Desktop 2 and 3 and Tableau Fundamentals. There's also a, a great, um, and somewhat underused course, it kind of goes in waves called Certification, What to Expect. This gives you, um, as an e-learning course, just kind of a more fun way to, to, to consume this information than, than you know, maybe on a PDF, you can get a sense for, ah, what is it all about uh, Tableau certification? How does that work? Um, as well as Tableau services and support. Uh, this, this course also, I think because it hides at the bottom of the page, uh, people are maybe less aware of it, but it's, it's terrific. Um, it gives you a really good overview without having to click around to a bunch of web pages to understand right how how to support um, and and all the different all the different services not only education um, work at Tableau in a really structured organized way and then new feature spotlight as well and I will go ahead and click this one just so you can get a sense and so in in many 
quarters, not in, not in every quarter, but in many quarters when there's a large um, release, then we, we show all, not all, many of the new uh, features, but we'll call it a curated list of the new features of, of that Tableau release. And it takes you, so kind of no matter um, where you're at in your journey, if you just wanna focus on what's new, what's in that new release, um, kind of without you know, learning the whole product, then you have the ability to do that with, with this course. And so you can see in, in this release that was, that was featured, there's Einstein discovery, uh, there's the quick LED calculation and ask data. Yeah, just wanted to kind of show you that really quickly. I don't want to dig deep into this course, but let's let's dig a little deeper into a different course. So we had looked at the analyst path. I'm just going to click that again. And now you, you don't see those lock signals anymore. They don't see the lock icons on, on each of these tiles. Um, you do see Tableau Fundamentals. I'm going to go ahead and, and just open up this course really quickly so you can get a sense uh, for what it looks like. I, uh, I will claim that I did complete desktop one e-learning when it was called that. Uh, but now that I'm retaking it, I'm only partway through the, the newer version called Tableau Fundamentals. And I'm just going to go ahead and click. I'll just, we'll just start here at the beginning. I won't, I won't dwell on this, but I'd just like you to see what sort of what, what the interface looks like. Just a little bit bigger. So you're always going to have navigation along the left and with you know nice, nice completion markers. And then you'll be able to, to sort of scroll down here in the, in the main section. Uh, most of these courses have, have a component of, of reading, right? So there's some content to read, but then there are frequent, frequent videos. The, the videos are going to be all different, all different types. So sometimes Oh, you'll find ones where there's a, there's a person talking. Other ones like this are, are conceptual in nature. They're trying to teach you a concept. And then there are many others that are um, literally showing the screen and, and showing you this is like, this is how it works. So I will just kind of keep going past that. You can see there's gonna be some more content. There's a lot of kind of small interactivities and larger interactivities. And this is, you know, I categorize this as a small interactivity to get the content, you know, you gotta, you gotta do some clicking. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm early in, in this module. And so there's, there's more conceptual content here. So here's another conceptual video. And then ending with, ending with a knowledge check. And it'll, it'll tell you if you got it right or wrong and it'll give you feedback. Um, and then a couple of knowledge check questions here. I'll just click this one at random. I didn't even read the question. Oh, I got it right. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. But then you can see there is, there is feedback as well. If, if, um, if I'd gotten it wrong, it, it would have explained the, the wrongness. Uh, and, then, and then you click next, you, you get the idea. You've, you've maybe seen e-learning um, in this style before. And so um, I just want to show off, kind of show off how that works. Josh, this has been, this has been absolutely great. And I, I, I can tell you this, I have taken mo most of the, well, I've taken the entire analytics track quite a bit. I have learned so much myself uh, by doing this. We had two uh, two questions come up. One was a question about the new features. Uh, do I have to have a e-learning license to go through the new feature modules? You know, when something new comes out. Yeah. And then the second question was just real, real quick because we're a little pressed for time on this. It has to do with uh, student licenses. But uh, it, yeah. do we have to? Do you have to have a license to uh, to do the the new features? Uh, you, you do, yep. So the, the new feature spotlight is is not one of those that's that's free on the sample site, and so okay. and and, yeah, and I will tell you because I I go out and I use them whenever whenever there's a new release. They are excellent. Okay. They are excellent. They are really really good. And is, then the other question was about students and and uh, who qualifies as a student and so, and how does that program work. Oh, oh, well, um, so from my perch, uh, my, my perch is, is, is really on the, on the um, I guess, the commercial side, right? And so the, the part of e-learning that, that we sell, there, there is a, a great group that, that also works on the academic side of things. So I, I wouldn't be able to say too much about sort of how the program works or who qualifies, except to, except to just point out that, you know, tableau.com slash academic is, is going to get you to this section where 
uh, students um, who have to be validated. Um, and I know that they work with, they do work with a validation company. And it's able to kind of understand, go a little deeper than just, is it a .edu or, or not? And I don't think you have to use a .edu, but they're able to, to figure out or to somehow work with the universities and the colleges to figure out, look, are you a student or are you not? And I'm sure there's a way to appeal that um, if, if there was an issue. But I did want to just point out that indeed you do get you do get uh, Tableau eLearning for Creator um, when you sign up uh, as a student, and you also get Tableau for free um, as a student. I'm just scrolling to the bottom here because yeah, there's there's always a way to get to take a free trial of Tableau. This you know this link would give you a 14 day free trial, but everyone I think you know knows about that anyway. But then at the top right, free student license. Right, and see, so then, then you end up here, um, students at accredited institutions are eligible for a free license. Uh, so this is not for instructors. Instructors click here and they go somewhere else, but students fill out this uh, piece of information. And then there's a verify student status. I've never gone through that one myself, but I know there's a, there's a little bit of a process. Um, I have gone through it, you know, and when I was a student, um, not for Tableau, but for others. And so I understand there's a bit of a verification process. I don't have the details behind that exactly. But see, they work with uh, Sheer ID um, on that. So, yeah. um, and do I have another minute or two, or, or are we are we at time? <laughs> Either way is okay. Yeah, we're, we're we're kind of pressed now, Josh. This this was really great. I, just for any parents in the room, you do not have to be a university student. You can be a high school student if you're 16 years or over you individually can get free, uh, you can get free educational materials and free copies of Tableau. If you're a teacher, if you are a teacher, you can apply for uh, free licenses for your entire class. You don't have to be at the university level. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to wrap it up there for if we're pressed on time. Um... Great, thanks, Josh. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Nick. And yeah, with that, we're ready for our next segment. Let's see, thank you for that. Um, just share my screen briefly. So the next thing up, the next item up is Tableau Online versus Server: A Conversation with Nick Sager and Brandon Brewer. Let me get set up here. Where's Brandon? There he is. I've arrived. And there, Brandon and Nick. Oh, hey, there I am. Welcome everyone to the Sagely Brews podcast, <laughs> broadcasting live through Nashville Tableau user group number 15. This is our first episode and a live episode. Thank you for being here. We talk about everything from thinking to drinking. Today, we're going to focus mostly on thinking and Tableau Online versus Tableau Server. Brandon, how about you introduce yourself to our audience today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wasn't aware we were on a podcast, so this is great. Um, <laughs> I am uh, Brandon Brewer. I work for Louisiana Pacific. I'm a business intelligence analyst out there. And uh, for the last year or so, uh, my role has been to be, uh, I would say, the chief Tableau evangelist uh, at LP. We have been a Microsoft shop and a Power BI shop. And so um, starting about last April, we did a Tableau proof of concept and I've been running a one man Tableau shop for the last year and some change. And now we have uh, embarked on what is sure to be a wonderful project of transitioning our entire company over to Tableau. So, um, that's, that's where sort of my role comes in. I, I sort of uh, made the decisions around server and online for us and uh, how to get that, that up and running. So, and when I'm not doing that, I've got three, uh, three small children that I, I run around and chase, um, coach all their sports teams and stuff. So that's where you'll find me at if I'm not talking about Tableau stuff. Nice. Well, I'm a lead analytics engineer at Nava Health by day and a lead consultant for Silver Bullet Analytics by Night, as well as a Tableau user group leader 
and a division director at Toastmasters. So I guess I do a little too much leading. Maybe I should try some following here with Brandon. But I'm also a Tableau junkie. I've been using Tableau server for years now. I've lost count. And I've worked as a Tableau server admin as well as a developer, publisher, producer, creator. Um, so really just excited to talk to Brandon today about this and see who wins, Tableau server or Tableau online? We know the answer to that already. Thank you. Do we though? Do we? <laughs> so Brandon, like what, um, what kind of scenarios do we even need to talk about this? You know, who might be interested in server or who might be interested in online? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a number of situations where this comes up. Obviously uh, in our situation, we were a, a new Tableau customer so, you know, if you're, if you're a new enterprise customer and you're sort of looking at, you know, which direction you're going to go with your Tableau instance, this conversation is going to come up. Um, and another one that I think happens, uh, I would say happens relatively frequently is if, you, if you're on server um, or, you know, an, an older version of server specifically, uh, and, and you're coming up for a major upgrade, you're going to go um, to, to a newer version of Tableau that's got map layers. So that you can start building that uh, stuff that Sarah's going to talk to us about here in a little bit. Um, and you're thinking, man, I, I, do we need to stay on server? Or, you know, what's online's offering now? So maybe you're having that conversation there. So I think those are at least two. Do you have, I mean, are there, are there others that, that you yeah. can think of that, that might come up or when you might have this conversation? I think there's one or two. Um, one might be the whole transition on or off the cloud. I've been a part of organizations that seems like every two years they're pushing to get on the cloud. And then two years later, they've got to get off the cloud and they got to get back on the cloud, either because there was some major HIPAA violation that prompted it, that was in the news. And now everyone's scared of the cloud or, you know, there's some advancement within AWS or who knows what that I was going to say all the more secure. Like a, huh? so that sounds, that, I was going to say that sounded very much like a healthcare horror story on <laughs> the cloud every two years. Sure, it's kind of a perfect storm. And then another, which I think it would be kind of an existing customer, but one who doesn't already have Tableau server or online, somebody who's making workbooks, refreshing them on their local machine and sending them out via email for people to use in Tableau Reader. I think that's the kind of person or institution who needs to figure out which one, but they definitely need to get on either online or server. Yeah, I mean, if you're... If you're trying to scale your analytics program at all, that that lone wolf developer who's refreshing Tableau, all of their Tableau workbooks on their local PC and sending them out, I, I, I don't know, I'm breaking out in halves a little bit just thinking about it. That, that <laughs> yeah. gives me great, great amounts of anxiety. Right. Not, not the best use of your time as an analyst, uh, yeah. for sure. So I, look, I, think I guess... Yeah, hey, go ahead. I was going to say, so let's, let's get to it, man. So... Um, you know, Tableau Online, Tableau Server seems to be, you know, the primary offerings for this, uh, you know, to get this thing out of scale. So let's start with where these things are similar, right? Help me paint the picture. If, if we're drawing a Venn diagram, where, where is the overlap? What are these things doing that, it's, that is exactly the same? Sure. Well, the biggest selling point, I think, at least the most obvious, would be the automated data refreshes. Um, I, yeah. Again, you were talking about breaking out in hives. I think that there, whether you're on Tableau Online or Tableau Server, always knowing that your data is current on a schedule, not having to be the one clicking the button to re re refresh the data. I think that's a major selling point. Yeah, I've got a, um, if anybody's interested, I've got a horror story about manual refreshes that I, that I, that 2020 Brandon, who was just getting started, backed himself into a corner on. So happy to talk through that uh, mistake and learning situation if anybody wants to talk about it. So yeah. show me on the um, Tableau online interface. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, you know, what? we don't have to get into it. I, I'm happy to talk about it, but I, I backed myself into a refresh corner that was not, not fun to get out of. So um, thank you for chat to Tableau for upgrading every quarter and eventually saving my life. Um, another thing that I think they, they share in common is the, the distribution at scale, right? E either solution you go with, again, similar to the refreshes and stuff like that, it allows you to get analytics and run an analytics department at scale and support your business and, and make sure that they're they're making decisions on the best data and really, really grow this thing so that you can um, 
you know, move from a data aware company to a data driven company, which is what we're all trying to get to. I think there's some uh, benefits regarding security and permissions as well that you can control who can and can't access a workbook. Once, once you put something in email, it seems like it just begs to be shared and sent to people who might not have any business looking at it or maybe just they don't need that distraction, right? We, we get enough information to uh, overload ourselves with that we don't need uh, Tableau dashboards for that. Right. I think, or um, another one I think that comes up a lot is that you can, I mean, you can, you can check your engagement, right? If I'm just sending out an email with a bunch of Tableau files to who, I don't know who's opening that. Um, but we can start to see, you know, with the metrics that Tableau provides in both online and server, you can see, you know, what users are doing on these sites. And so, you know, it allows your, your analytics team to adapt and to be agile and really sort of move the needle uh, be more proactive in, in what the users need or they don't have currently. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to be a, an analytics shop worth your salt, you've got to have some kind of feedback. And a great form of feedback is to know whether they're using it or not. Um, yeah, no doubt. So, so, what's so, yeah, what's so great about online? Like, yeah, well, online, I think uh, I, I'm going to speak specifically, you know, because it's very, very close to my heart. I'm going to speak specifically to our, our instance. Um, and I think the, the number one front and center thing for us, um, again, I've, I've been, uh, you know, sort of a one man tableau shop for a little bit while we did the proof of concept and sort of rolled things out, showed it to our business and sort of proved out the value um, was that I didn't have to throw server admin onto, you know, an already heavy workload of development and data and site administration setup and all that stuff. I didn't have to throw on server maintenance and administration to that sort of workload. So Tableau, you know, owning that, um, that maintenance of the server is a huge one. Um, as part of that, um, I get the latest version of Tableau as soon as it comes out, you know, cause I don't have to wait on, you know, the, the work log of our team or internal IT or anything like that on our operations or server side. Tableau's, you know, I'll get, I'll get an, a notification several weeks in advance, like, hey, we're going to upgrade your Tableau online. And then it is, and it works, and everything's <laughs> perfect. Um, so always being up to date. I know, you know, I've talked to a couple of folks, and Jim specifically comes to mind. We're, there are a lot of companies who are four, five, six releases behind. And Nick, I think you guys are a couple of re releases behind. Yeah. Just because it's just such a big deal to upgrade. Um, another one, it's... It's fast. One of the things that we were looking at when we were doing this, obviously, uh, you all right there? Yeah, good. Uh, 2020 was an interesting year for everybody. Um, and one of the things with Tableau Server was the setup, sort of just help them helping us and us getting you know, everything set up in our on-prem sources. And uh, we didn't know when we were going to be able to do that. And with Tableau Online, they, you know, the way I envision it in my head is that somebody was sitting at Tableau's you know, offices and they just flip the light switch and then I was able to work. So uh, that was super helpful. Um, and then for us too, um, you know, Tableau being bought by Salesforce suggests to me, and even Josh has talked a, a few minutes ago where they were talking about moving from desktop one to Tableau fundamentals because they want to include online in that. I think, I think Tableau and Salesforce and that merger is, is they're moving, at least in my opinion, it, it seems like they're going to be sort of cloud committed um and cloud com and committed to the online offerings that they can that they can provide so i, I can only imagine that things are just going to keep keep getting better uh with tableau online and they're they're pretty good already so i have no complaints so but i mean let me offer you the same same in return man why why would somebody go with server as opposed to to online well with great power comes great responsibility and having your own server instance is some great power a lot of autonomy, but like you said, we, we do have to manage our own upgrades. But that also means that we have a lot more control over various aspects of things. Um, you know, one of the benefits would be those engagement insights you mentioned earlier. I know there's out of the box reporting that you can get with Tableau Online, and, and that same out of the box reporting or metadata reporting on usage is available in Tableau server. But if you configure your server right, you can connect to Tableau server as a data source and make all kinds of custom 
uh, analytics tools out of your own data, you know, your own usage. Uh, you can make sure that the, um, the people who have access are using it. Like you want to know what your adoption rate is and not yeah. everyone in the company has access to everything. So you want to have a good ratio that gives that number. Um, you can also create like a dashboard of dashboards or a tableau of contents or just have every workbook that you have access to every, you know, using real level security and things to make a dashboard customized for your users. The other thing would be uh, command line tools and scripting. You can better integrate that Tableau metadata with your other data and other user data and just get a complete profile, complete picture of your user base and what they're doing and make sure you're serving them very well. Uh, the, the other thing, you know, more along the lines of responsibility would be the multi-tenant opportunity. If you want to build automated workbooks for a variety of end users who are your customers, like paying customers, and you want to create those silos, uh, Tableau Server is going to be your best bet because you can make your own sites and keep each of those sections of the server distinctly separate so that there's no crossing the streams. Whereas, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but I think to do that with Tableau Online, you'd have to create a separate site and that which is a separate license for each quote silo. Yeah, I um that 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 is a for, for me that's that's a really cool functionality that Tableau Server has that Tableau Online does not. Um, that multi-site capability in a single server instance is really, really cool. Um, we're able to we we're able to sort of mimic that using projects and permissions, but you know, there's always be there's there's never a problem with having more security around stuff like that and access to, to specific data. So yeah, I think that's a that's a, a really cool a really cool differentiator on some level. Has uh, Amy, I'm gonna butcher the name Bindre has a great comment regarding uh, COVID dashboards online for Nashville. That the the citizens were very interested in those dashboards getting a lot of traffic. Um, Tableau Online can scale with that traffic, can't they? Or can't it? Yes. Um, so that, that's a fair point. One, one other benefit, again, on the side of autonomy and control would be full API functionality. As, as I understand it, um, all the API calls you can make against Tableau server are fully available, but there may be some limitations with Tableau Online. So that, that's true. I, and I think there are some limitations with sort of the API functionality, uh, some some specific features that you aren't allowed, aren't able to use currently. Same thing with command line. We can do command line things and, and do a lot of that with Tableau yeah. Online. There are just features and, and, and parts of that that you you can't you can't access. But when we when we ran that sort of I guess um, analysis on what we could and couldn't do for our for our use case, there was nothing in those API functionalities that we didn't have in Tableau Online that was a a deal breaker. So yeah. I don't know. I, I I may not be the best resource on that. I don't know exactly everything that Tableau Online doesn't have functionality to do, but the stuff that we wanted to do, we were able to. Sure. And I think the only other thing that would make Tableau Server a no-brainer for an organization or for an analytics team, again, around that control and that autonomy would be uh, compliance. You know, I know that lots of cloud implementations can be or are supposedly natively HIPAA compliant or uh, great for being secure around people's private information. But there's a lot of institutions especially a lot of IT departments that just say no, you know, there's no cloud ever. Uh, we, we can't guarantee that we're compliant unless we have full control over those aspects. And I think that's largely why Tableau Server is as popular as it is. Plus I think it existed before Tableau Online. So that probably- Yeah, and I, first I, think, I, think a lot of, I think a lot of folks, you know, I think there was a bigger gap in functionality between Tableau Online and Tableau Server probably like five years ago. I know yeah. even, even my director, when I brought Tableau online to him originally, he was like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. Um, and we were able to talk through and, and sort of work through it. And then also to your point on the security, we had to have multiple conversations with our chief security officer at LP 
sitting down with Tableau's uh, sort of security folks and, and talking through their, you know, SOC, SOC 2 compliance and, and all that stuff that we care about. Um, we don't have quite the regulatory, you know, burdens of a, of a healthcare or, you know, credit card company or some, somebody like that that's, you know, mortgage industry, something like that. But sure. uh, we, we certainly had our own data concerns. We wanted to make sure that they were uh, secure. And we, you know, after talking to them, our, our, our chief security officer gave us the green light. So I feel good about it. Cool. Well, there, there's still one piece that I think you have on or Tableau Online has on Tableau server, uh, the total cost of ownership. Yeah. And, and I think this is, a, this is a interesting thing that folks will have to look at on their own. But when we ran the numbers for us, you know, we talked about, um, you know, setup costs and computing costs and, you know, us not having to bear the, the cost of all that stuff, you know, on a month to month, year to year basis. And in, in addition to the manpower and hours uh, required for server upgrades, you know, however, however often we wanted to do those, um, we, we came to the conclusion that it's, it costs us less money uh, in total to own Tableau online. Uh, in addition to the value that we, the value creation we get by having some of the more recent features and functionality. So um, I think when, when you run that analysis, and I would encourage everybody, if you, when you're having this conversation to run analysis on your own, because I think each each instance is going to be a little bit different in the numbers. But um, for us, it was, it ended up being a, a really, not a runaway, but it, it was, it was pretty clear for us online was going to be sure. the better choice from a cost perspective. Um, and I know, you know, there is a, the license structure itself is, it's a little bit more expensive on Tableau online again, because you're paying for Tableau to, to maintain it essentially in your license cost. Um, but again, when you ran the total cost, it was, it seemed, it made just a, a ton of sense for us. Yeah, but we, we get to have a pizza party every month when we stay late to do our upgrade. <laughs> Not every I'm, month, I guess every quarter. I'm really yeah. happy for you guys. Pizza's delicious. <laughs> my only part of that. So, so I guess we'll, Nick, let me ask you, man. So we, we've gone through, we've gone through sort of laying out the, the I guess the pros, cons, good, bad, and ugly of each. Uh, what should the people out there do? Well, Tableau like server, good. obviously. <laughs> no, it, I mean, to cut to the chase a bit, I feel like it's almost like the default answer is Tableau online, unless you can't. <laughs> And unless you have those those um, those features that you need, such as the multi-tenant or the compliance considerations, you know, you, IT won't support anything unless they're the ones that own it, sort of deal. Um, and then I you guess know what? what you're used to. You know, to. Nick, I, I've got to just tell everybody. I have we've done this talk a couple of times together, and your position toward Tableau Online has softened a little bit each time. And I've <laughs> progress here. Well, you know, there's an audience now. I, I don't want to rib you too much. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think, I mean, even for me, man, I think to your point, I, um, it, it just depends, right? It depends on sort of your use case. But I think, I think when you are, when you are ready to make that decision and you're ready to start having these conversations and those things come up, I think there's certain things that you should be looking at. There's a, a framework or at least sort of categories or buckets you can break this thing into to help make your decision. So I think, you, you got to think about who your end users are, right? I don't think we even talked about this, but Tableau Online doesn't have the, the visitor or guest pass or whatever that is that you, you that is technically an option in Tableau server. I know there's like a, you know, a pay or cost sort of threshold for that, but mm -hmm. Tableau Online doesn't have that guest pass. So you are going to have to pay for licenses for every user. So if you've got a thousand customers, you know, out in the world that need to view this, unless you want to pay for a thousand licenses, things can get really expensive on Tableau Online. But Who's going to be using it as a question? The people. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of processes in place? Do you have a place to manage this stuff? Right? Who do you? You know, what are your processes? What are your people in in your your resources in your own company? Again, for us, we didn't have anybody to do this this work uh, to maintain a server and all that stuff, and we just really needed a turnkey approach. And Tableau Online gave that to us. So, what is your budget? What's your resources? Um, what's the timing requirement? You know, what do you? When do you need this? How fast do things need to be up and running? <clears throat> and then I think too, to your point, Nick, what's the industry that you're in, right? If you're a healthcare in a healthcare industry, um, and HIPAA and and all that stuff is going to be a huge deal. And you 
if you have a HIPAA breach, you are not, you know, it's not just a, you have a data problem, you've got front page of CNN problem, right? That's, that's additional, sure. that's additional concerns. And I think things that people need to take into consideration, but I think if you can sort of follow that framework of your people, your processes, your resources, the timing, and then sort of what industry you're in, um, if you can bring it into those buckets and have conversations around those buckets, you're going to be able to get to the, the decision that makes the most sense for, for your specific use case. As much as I want to say it's Tableau online every time, I just don't know that I can do it. Uh, the, the options exist for a reason. Well, that, that's all the time we have today for this episode of Sagely Brews. Thank you for <laughs> your attention and you will catch us at the next episode. Subscribe to where all your favorite podcasts are found. Uh, let's clear up the spotlight. There we go. If you all prefer gallery view, that is an option. And next up, we have Sarah Battersby. I'm going to share my screen once again. Sarah's the principal research scientist for Salesforce um, at Tableau, and her primary area of focus is cartography. If you'd like to know more, a lot is available in our event evite. Let's welcome Sarah Battersby to talk to us about map layers. Sarah. Okay, I had to find my unmute button after I started there sharing it. my screen. <laughs> there it is. All right. So uh, thanks for inviting me in to, to talk with everybody about layers and dual access mapping. Uh, so these are just a couple different ways you have of getting you know, more than one thing onto your map, because oftentimes you want a bunch of stuff to see enough context to make some good decisions. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna go through some of the differences between the layer feature that was introduced in 2020.4 and the earlier method of using a dual axis map, just so you can you know, know a little bit about what those are. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you should have a little bit of time at the end, but if not, uh, my email and my Twitter information are on this slide. So feel free to, to reach out in other ways. And I'm just gonna go through a handful of slides first, and then I'm gonna show some demos in Tableau so you can see these things in action. Um, and a lot of the, the workbooks that I'm going to show. I actually have links up on Tableau Public. So I've already sent these slides over to Jim and he can send them out after, after the talk. So I'll start with just a, a little bit on dual access mapping. So this is the method for creating, you know, quote unquote layers that was available in earlier versions of Tableau. So anything before 2020.4, you were using dual access mapping. And it allowed you to duplicate the rows uh, duplicate your latitude and longitude on rows and columns. So I uh, just got my cursor over it, a little, uh, little attention grabber on it. So you can see I've got two copies of latitude on rows. And that was how you told Tableau that you wanted to have two different things going on. So that gave you two different marks cards. And in this case, I could show both polygon data and point data on top of it. Uh, so that, that effectively gives us two different layers on the visualization. But there are a lot of limitations with it. Um, yeah, you, know, you can only build up to two different layers and it you know, requires a single data source. So you have to figure out ways to get your data sets to talk to each other, which could be a little bit, um, sometimes that's a little bit complicated. Um, I ended up answering so many questions about how to make dual access maps that I wrote a blog post on the Tableau community forums specifically on that, where I just went through every kind of data file that I could think of and how to squish them into a dual access map. So if that is something that you need to do, um, I have the link to the dual access mapping many ways blog post uh, up at the top. I think that's probably my best read blog post. Um, apparently it, it struck a chord with people that making a dual access map was, was kind of hard. So fortunately in 2020.4, we introduced a layering feature for maps. So that allows you to build out as many layers as you want in your visualization. You, know, you don't have to stop at two like we had with the dual access. I mean, in fact, the, the map that I put on here as an example has seven different layers on it, which is you know, pretty cool. Just kind of keep adding stuff on there um, until you get the context one that you want. Um, and 
Recently in 2021.2, we introduced this layer control widget, um, which is a really nice feature. So I'll just highlight that on this, this image here. So that layer control widget actually allows, you know, so not only you can build up a map with a bunch of different layers on it, but you can give the user some control in adjusting those layers. So turning them on and off or locking them so that they aren't included in selections. And that's really nice because it means that you now have control over layers from outside of the editing um, portion of a worksheet. So if you're using this on server or online, as we just heard a, a, a good debate about those two, you know, if you haven't have this up on Tableau Public, Tableau Server, Tableau Online, or you're just sharing a workbook with somebody and you're on looking at something on the dashboard, you can use this layer control widget to then interact with the layers and turn things on and off. And there are a lot of really neat, um, really neat applications for that that I'll walk through a few of those. So a super important note, um, whether you're working with a dual axis map or with layers, is that um, at this point you do have to get your data together into a single data source. So in other words, you have to figure out how to get all of the different parts that you want, you know, your spatial data and your non-spatial data, you have to get them all talking to each other. Now, the common ways that people do this are through some kind of joins or relationships, They're either a spatial join, so you're looking at what polygon does each of my points fall into, or based on some kind of common attribute, oh, they all have the same state name or some kind of unique identifier, um, or through unions, for instance. Um, and this example right here shows a number of different spatial files that are being unioned, so I can add them all together. Uh, social vulnerability at the census tract level for a bunch of states in the southeastern United States. Sorry, I did not include Tennessee um, in this particular image. If I'd been thinking about it, I would have tacked on another file. So you can see that data as well. But it's just four different spatial files that I union together. So they become one single data source in Tableau. And then I added in my hurricane path data uh, just using, oh, it's actually a zero equals one relationship. So it gives me all of the rows from each of my different tables. So there are a lot of creative ways to kind of, you know, fudge around getting your data sources to talk to each other. Another example of how to get your, your data sets talking together to make that single data source is just to use a purely attribute based join. Uh, so for example, in the top image here, I'm using three copies of a state's data set and they all relate to each other using the state FIPS code, um, which is just a unique identifier for each state. Um, but I'm using three different data sets that have three different versions of the geography. So when I wanna layer those together, I just have them all linked together using this ID because every point and line and polygon knows which state it belongs to. So that I can just do with a real quick um, attribute relationship. Or you can also use spatial joins to connect two data sets. So in this example right here uh, on the bottom, I have census tracts and farmers markets. So the farmers markets are points, the census tracts are polygons, and I wanna get those talking to each other as a single data source. So I can use a spatial intersection in Tableau where we can actually figure out for each of those point locations, you know, based on the latitude and longitude of the point, which polygon does it fall inside of? So then every farmer's market knows the census tract relationship. Every census tract knows how it relates to the farmer's markets. And you know, up through 2021.2, that's just been a point and polygon relationship. But um, if you're playing with the pre-release of 2021.3 already, or you're excited about the pre-release or the full release of 2021.3, we are introducing, um, I call it join all of the things. And we are going to be able to do relationships between polygons and polygons, polygons and lines, points and lines, and uh, the point in polygon that we already had. So if you have two polygon data sets, you wanna say, tell me um, how all of these overlap. Uh, you can do that in 2021.3. And I will admit, I have been having a lot of fun playing with that. And I'm not going to show it to you right now, but you know, I'm sure Jim has probably just jotted down on his sheet of paper for wrangling extra speakers that you know, six months from now, maybe I'll, I'll get an opportunity to come back and tell you about the other fun things you can do with spatial joins. So now I'm going to do a couple demos just so you can see some interesting layering things in action. And I put all of the demos that I'm going to do, I've got links to each of them on this page. And so when Jim sends out the slides after, um, 
after the, the tug is over, you'll have access to all of these and they're just up on Tableau Public, so easy to get to. So I'm gonna start out with, um, with this first workbook. And this is, this is not a visualization that I created. This is a visualization of the day um, from Fei Ho. And she made a really cool Singapore map on population housing and infrastructure. And I thought that this was just a super way to show how layers can be used to add context to your map and how giving users control over those layers will allow them to tailor the map for a specific question that they might have. So I went ahead and downloaded that workbook through my, my nice little intro uh, dashboard on the front. So it looks all, looks all special. And then I'm just gonna show you, you know, really what her workbook was doing. So this is a map of Singapore and it's got a bunch of different layers. And when I highlight or put my cursor over the map, there's this little button that shows up for control map layers which opens up a nice little map widget called layer control, which gives me the name of each of the layers in the data set. So now I could say, I'm really interested in learning more about Singapore, but there's a lot of stuff on the map. So maybe I'm gonna get rid of, I don't know, housing types. And maybe I'll get rid of all of the aquatic facilities. And uh, I like the rail lines, but let, let's, get rid of, let's get rid of the rail stations. That just seems like too much stuff on there. So now I've been able to adjust the map as a user to say the context that I need on here to understand the spatial pattern or to explore has now been tailored to just what I want. And what's even nicer, I think, is that there are these little lock looking icons next to each one of the layers. So not only can I turn things on and off, I can actually lock things down. So I'll go ahead and lock the rail lines and the population data. So now if I do a selection on this visualization, it is not going to select those data sets. It's not gonna select any of the rail lines. It's not gonna select any of the polygons for population. Now, if I unlock those, I can go back through and do a selection and it's gonna leave those in. So it's giving users this control to be able to selectively um, decide what context they want, and then to interact with the map and tailor the way that they can interact with it. So I'll just jump to another example of how I use layers a whole lot. Um, so one of the ways that I use mapping really regularly is to try and tell a story about what's happening in a particular location. And so this is a map that I put together to look at food deserts, and it just takes a data set from USDA and it walks through how a food desert is calculated, you know, what are the components that go into it, and then gives a creative way of exploring it at the end. So when I use this with, for communication, I open up my layers, and for my layer control, I have four different layers in here. And it's actually exactly the same data, just with different attributes on each layer. So we can talk about the story of thinking about what is a food desert. Now, the first component that goes into it is access. Do you have access to um, healthy foods? And you know, there are a number of different ways of measuring. You know, what does it mean to have access to healthy foods? And so I have a parameter and I actually have it on the workbook over here on the right-hand side with the, um, I think seven, different def seven or eight different definitions that can be used to define whether or not a census tract has low access or not. So I can use this parameter now and I can change the binary variable that's showing on my first layer of my map. Maybe I wanna know which, which tracts are low access when I consider access to be um, less than half a mile. So I can change to that particular uh, choice. It'll recalculate. My computer has been moving a little bit slowly today, so I apologize. Uh, this is normally a pretty quick workbook, but I think I've done something strange to my laptop. Um, and I probably have to restart it, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, the point is, you know, I can pick any of these different um, different parameter options and see how access changes with that particular choice. So we could talk about access, which count, which tracts have high access, which tracts have low access, but that's only half of the equation, because in order to be considered on that food desert uh, spectrum, you both have to have low access and be in a low income area. So then we can look at that second attribute, which is just 
whether or not a census tract is considered low income or not. So we can move on to that. We see another visualization of South Carolina where we've just got this binary for each of the census tract. Are you low income? Are you low access? But we have to combine the two of them in order to understand if it's somewhere that would be considered a food desert. So you have to be both low income and low access. So then we can turn on that third layer and we can see the combination of how these two attributes get put together. And what I've done on this layer to make it more interesting for people who are interacting with it is I've added in this tool tip on this, just on this particular layer so that you can see um, the access, the in, so we're showing low access using vehicle access and at 20 miles in rural areas. Yes, that's true. And you can see all of the other access metrics. So you would be able to see for any of the other ways of calculating access, does this tract, um, is it a, a cool way of looking at the data sets together and saying, oh, you know, this particular census tract is really sensitive to how we define access. But there are some other census tracts. Let me see if I can find a good one here. Yeah, I'll never be able to do it on the fly. Um, but there are some census tracts that are always um, low access and low income, no matter what definition you use. So then if we keep, you know, kind of talking through the story of, you know, what makes for a food desert, um, yeah, you might is a food desert because you need to be both low income and low access. So then I add another layer on top to finish out the story that shows what's called the bivariate choropleth map. And I'll just jump over to my income and access dashboard because that might make it a little bit clearer what's going on with this data set. Um, but I have two different, um, two different measures, access or low access, low income or not low income. So I could now go through and highlight things independently and say, here are all of the locations that are low access and low income. Oh, but maybe it might be interesting to know what all of the places are that are low income but have reasonable access. How are those distributed? Or all of the locations that have low access but are not low income. So I could highlight those instead. So I can use the layer option to just walk through that story. Another way that I like to use. Um, use the layering feature is to hide things and use them to control a visualization. So one of the complaints that I have heard um, in Tableau with point features is, I don't like it when I filter down to a single point location and the zoom is just way too far out. So this is um, showing airport locations. I'll see if I can show, uh, trying to think what is, what is the airport code and, Nashville. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. We'll go to, I was gonna say we can go to Memphis. That's at least, you know, in the right state. <laughs> um, so I go to that airport. And if I really care about the airport, I do not need to see a zoom that is Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. I care about the airport, not like the 6,000 miles around the airport. So you can use layers um, and some of the buffer calculations in Tableau to customize things like your Zoom. So hopefully this will this will try update to uh, uh, let's get Memphis back because at least I know that one's going to work. So here I'm zoomed to the Memphis airport, but notice it's a lot closer than the default zoom on that last map. And I have a toggle so I can say, oh, I want to buffer distance. I want to look within a mile of the airport. I want to look within 25 miles of the airport. I want to look within five miles of the airport. So I'm using layers in a really sneaky way to tailor this visualization. And the way I'm doing that is I have two layers. So over on the left-hand side of my Tableau window on the marks card, you can see I've got two layers, one called airports and one called buffer of airport. So the buffer of airport is just a real quick calculation that says, take the location of my selected airport. I'll just bring this over so you can see it. And I'll move that down. So make a point out of my airport location and then buffer out a specified distance, which is being read from a parameter that I created and use miles. And what that's doing is it's creating a polygon. And that polygon, is in my second layer, my buffer airport layer.
Did we lose Sarah? Sarah, are you gone? I think so. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, technical difficulties. Well, do we want to transition to uh, Kahoot? Sure. You want to give her a second to rejoin or? Yeah, I think. What if we gave her a second and we could do the community stuff, Nick? Okay. Your community updates. Yeah. I'll share my screen. There you go. So we've got our announcement slide here. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a shame that we lost Sarah right there because that was really the interesting part. We were really getting down to it. Hey, uh, we're going to kill a little time. Hopefully, uh, Sarah's going to come back. Uh, just a real quick on the uh, community spotlight. Every month, I put up the healthcare link, and I hope uh, I hope the people in healthcare are taking advantage of it. There are some job openings that I'm aware of, and I'm, I also know that there's some other people on this call that are uh, aware of some job openings. Also, uh, Tableau is continuing to hire people, so there are opportunities directly with Tableau. Uh, JLL is continuing to hire people, so there's opportunities there. Here in Nashville, I know there's some openings over at A.O. Smith. I looked at that this morning and there's a couple of different levels of opening. And I became aware today that GitHub is looking for some people also. So uh, if you're interested in uh, GitHub, that uh, uh, you might wanna go out and check their site and see what's available. Now, Brandon, you had something that you wanted to talk about, didn't you? Uh, yeah, so we've got at, at LP, We, you guys are privy now to the fact that we've been doing a um, a big sort of Tableau initiative. We're going to be hiring probably three to four analysts over the next few months. We've got several opening or a couple of those openings are already open right now. Um, and we're looking to hire those pretty quickly. So if you guys are, if you know anybody or are interested in sort of helping, helping us make that jump and transition everything over to Tableau, we, we desperately need the help. Yeah. And I think we'll, See if we can save the rest for last. Uh, Sarah's back with us. So we'd like for her to have the opportunity to pick up where she left off. Welcome back, Sarah. Thanks. I, I, I have no clue where I left off because all of a sudden I just realized that there was Sarah, no cool just, little logo yeah. at the top. <laughs> Sarah, you were just at the really good part. <laughs> oh, okay, the really good part. You were uh, sneaking the buffer polygon to control the zoom. Oh yeah, here's my my, my cool zoom. buffer. So I've made the buffer visible here so you can see it. Um, I can change the size and that buffer is just gonna get a little bit smaller and the zoom got in a little closer, a little bit smaller and the zoom will get a little bit closer. And the whole thing that's driving that is that it's been added to the zoom extent, which is a feature on the marks card. So I added that to the zoom extent and I removed the airports from the zoom extent. So we can tailor what level of zoom we get for any location just by using these cheater buffers. Now, sometimes I've gotten the question of, can I create these like visual bookmarks? Yeah, I want people to be able to jump quickly to be able to look at just my North America facilities and then just my uh, Southeast Asia facilities and then just my South America facilities. But I don't want to, um, I don't want to filter out all of the other data. I want all the data to be visible. I just want the zoom to change. And you can do that with a really similar technique. You just create a buffer and you take its color and you make it completely invisible. And then you make it so people can't select it. So you would just disable the selection on the marks card. And then you can use nice things like uh, parameters to change your location. Yeah, so I think it's just kind of a fun trick. And I wrote a blog post on how to do that as up on the community forums. But it's a nice way to get exactly the, the boundary that you want um, just by using some of the built-in features and layers. Now, the last thing I wanted to show, um, and I'll just show this quickly, but I want to show how you could use layers to do some design customization. Um, so I've got three different copies of the same data set here. I've got states. I've got a stripe fill copy of states and I have an outline version of the states. And I just have them all talking to each other based on the identifier for the state. 
So it's just, just a couple of relationships that I set up. And what I can do with that is I can then layer those different um, data sets to make some kind of cool visual effects. So I can drop the geometry for my states on and I got, you know, just the states, you know, not very exciting, looks just like every other map. I'll drop the name on so I can select them individually. And I'm just gonna keep the lower 48 here. So I've just got my states and I, I get this question all the time, which is I want a really cool outline on each of my states. And I was like, oh, but there is an outline. You know, there's this nice color and I can go in and say, oh, I want that outline to be red and yay, great. Now I have a red outline and they're like, no, 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 no. But I wanna actually be able to control that outline. So I just add in a second copy of my geometry that's just the outline. So I'm gonna drop that on as a new layer. So I've got my state's outline right here. And now I have this, this nice blue outline that's shown up and we'll make it, uh, I don't, we'll make it yellow because that's kind of a good bold color. So now I've got this yellow outline that looks very much like the black outline that was around the states by default, except now I can control that with the size slider. So if I want a thicker outline, I can do that. If I want a thinner outline, I can do that. If I want that outline, just make it a little bit thicker so you can see it again. If I want that outline to have a bit of transparency on it, I can change that property because this is just a, this is just a line file. And Tableau can read that geometry in really easily. So then if I want say like a nice custom fill, you know, these states are great. I've got them color coded based on some really useful attribute here. We'll I'm not going to color code them based on state name because that would actually be a lot of crazy different colors. But let's say I had some other characteristic that was really important. I wanted to have two different um, symbolization methods, the fill, and then I wanted like some stripes on top to highlight specific locations. I have a stripe fill um, geometry, so I can just drop that on. And my particular stripe fill um, actually has stripes going both directions, but I can just filter out the ones that are going the, the way that I, you know, the wrong way really easily because I made a little calculation for it. So I'll just hide those. And so now I have this really kind of bright, unpleasant to look at stripe fill. I will make that a little bit thinner on top of my states, on top of my outlines. I can adjust that layer so the outlines are on top of the stripes. And using that, you can put together all sorts of different combinations of design. So just to, to show a few examples, I made one just like super crazy map of, I threw a lot of layers at this. I've got some bright green outlines. I've got some stripes representing the name of the state. Um, yeah, you can get a lot of design elements on here or you can use them to, to tailor your selections. So I created a couple different sets here and I'm using some set actions to control them. And so this is showing my selected states. I have a hash fill in them and it's color coded. And then I've got an outline to show that the states are selected versus the other locations. And then I have an action so that I can click on any other state and I can add it to the set or remove it if it's already in there. So as soon as I add it, it's gonna go inherit all of those properties that I have for my other state locations. So um, South Dakota just got that nice red outline and it got that nice stripe fill, which is gonna distinguish it from all of the other locations. In case you wanna know about this map and the, the three very important colors that are being rendered on there, there are the orange stripe states where I have lived. There are the purple stripe states where my people live. Um, and then there's the blue stripe, which is you know just another state. It's hanging out. I haven't lived there. I don't have family there. But it's a way of combining some of those different layering elements, some of the ways that you can make some custom designs, and then ways that you can add a little action in so that you can let people interact and have the visualization update with all those design elements that go with it. And I'll just go ahead and remove that so you can see that I can both add states and remove them um, from that selection. So there's just a few fun things that you can do with layering that I want to show you. And all of these workbooks are up on Tableau Public. So you can go ahead and download them and play with them. And if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, this is you know, playing with maps and figuring out kind of crazy things to do with them is it's like my hobby job. Um, fortunately, Tableau um, pays me to do that uh, most of the time as opposed to you know, the other work that I do.
Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions about that. I'll go ahead and stop and we can get back to the regularly scheduled rest of the, the talk. That was, that was excellent. Thank you, Sarah. I had to check to make sure I was off mute. <laughs> but well done and excellent recovery from the technical difficulties. I appreciate you coming back and uh, finishing that. There's so much that I've learned and I will use in my day job. All right, we've got a little bit of time. I think, Eric, you have a Kahoot prepared, correct? Sure. Yeah, all right. Let's do it. So if you haven't done this before, there's a game pin that's about to show on the screen. You can go to www.kahoot.it or Kahoot it. You'll be prompted to put in that pin number to join our game. And uh, I believe also asked to put in your name. Um, All right. See. So I got a little flack about how hard the test or the quiz was last time. So this is a Tableau Basics quiz. So uh, no fancy stuff about uh, Latin lawns or joins or such. It's pretty you know, simple things of how do you Tableau. How do you tell him? There we go. Any more takers? The clock resets if you join. So you got seven seconds to give everyone else a chance. Four, three, two, one. All right. So today's basic quiz. First one is just a poll. Answer any uh, one that you want. What are you good at? So analytics and business intelligence, artificial intelligence, business functions, or programming in R and Python, et cetera. Tell us what you like to do. I am definitely not an AI guy. Right, most people are just BI, zero AI. So yeah, I'm not the only non-AI guy around here. Okay, which were presented at our June meeting? Another multi-answer question. The more you get correct, the more points you will score. Tableau prep, Iron Quest, Regex, or real world fake data. Three of these were presented at our June meeting. One was not. Regex was presented at our May meeting. So there you go. Nice. Number three, what is data visualization? A method of passing information clearly, making complex data more understandable, all answers are correct, or a form of communication. All answers are correct. There you go, seven people got it right, congratulations. All right, number four, which KPI is behind PACE? And I will apologize, I did not make this graphic or be more readable. KPI seven, KPI three and seven, KPI two or KPI one, which is behind PACE? KPI two is correct. Wow, everybody got it right. Maybe I don't have to apologize for that graphic. I thought the text was pretty small. <laughs> okay, which purpose of the bar group? The purpose of a bar graph is to present continuous data. 
look at pretty colors show change over time or compare categorical data. All right. Wow. Everybody, uh, maybe I made this too easy. Everybody's getting them correct. <clears throat> The difference is how quickly you get it correct with cahoots. So the goal of any data visualization is to transform data into useful information, close the digital divide, help those who can't do math, or help those who can't read. <laughs> but the two bottom ones are correct, both correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've got some of those users. Yep. Oh, Brandon. Brandon snuck in there for the win. All right. Yeah. Thank you all for playing today. Thank you for setting that up. You're welcome. It was fun. I will stop sharing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, so back to our regularly scheduled program. We're doing just fine on time. I will share the PowerPoint again. All right, should be able to see Jim's slide. Uh, where did we leave off? We were at the point leave? where Brandon was talking about uh, an opening that he had. And, yes. and after he's done, we'll open it up to the floor if anybody else has a uh, job opening or they're looking for an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I was done. Uh, other than to say, we're doing senior and and junior. So whether you're entry level or a couple of years or a, a real senior, we we need everybody. So other than that, hit me up. Okay. Sure. And, um, we at Nava Health do not have a rec up just yet, but we are having an opening for an associate level position. Um, I'll put my email you're interested or would like me to send you the link when we have it, I will do that. Um, Anybody else out there? Okay. Okay, moving ahead. Next month in August, it's going to be a noon meeting. Okay, I'm going to emphasize that again. Noon, 12 o'clock, noon, central time. Uh, meeting. So uh, plan ahead. Now we've got Anna Ford. And for those of you who don't know uh, Anna, she is a, she's, she's a great speaker and she does some wonderful storytelling. Uh, and she is a stats wizard. I mean, she, re she really truly is. So she's going to be speaking to us about visualizing uh, data and visualizing survey data. And then we've got kind of an interesting uh, segment. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to do you want to introduce this? Sure. So I heard this um, presentation probably six or eight weeks ago by some of the um, data analysts for Atlanta Public Schools, and I thought that it might be something that could be applicable to everyone. But it is not just looking at like you know, I guess cases or deaths or vaccinations, it's actually looking at survey data that was sent out to parents and surveying them. Um, so principals can use this information on a daily basis and that school administrators could make a, adjustments to their plans um, in trying to kind of get the privileges and security set appropriately. So everyone at the various um, entities could make their decisions, even though it's a very large organization. So I think it could be applicable to a number of people. Great. Sounds great. Be like we'll have, we'll have how to visualize survey data and then how to organize survey data. That's it. Is that it? That's it. 